My name is John Cornicello, and I welcome you to my series of interactive photo conversations. You can check out the schedule at cornicello.com slash conversations for dates and times of upcoming shows. Um, this week, we've got an open discussion on Thursday the 18th, and next Monday, Jeff Shiwi is going to be our guest for his birthday. You'll also find links to previous conversations there. If you know a photographer you'd like to see on the show, please send us both an intro email. Today, my guest is Dan Burkholder. Uh, I think many of you know him better than I do, but I'll give you a little introduction. Dan is known for looking over photography's horizon to discover new ways of capturing and expressing the photographic image. Uh, he's also written about mobile photography and iPhone artistry, and he's constantly looking for new approaches, subject matter, and can, in chemical or digital technologies. So please welcome, while well, he still have my breath, Dan Burkholder. <laughs> well, 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 thanks, John, very much, and for everyone else for being here today. Um, you know, it's, it's just a delight to be able to talk about photography in any kind of, any kind of form and context. So I've I put together a little slideshow you've done via Keynote, which is sort of like PowerPoint done right. And I'll give you a heads up. We've been having some horrible, I told John this morning, horrible internet things. I've had the technicians here. We've replaced modems and routers and all kinds of things. So I'm not sure what's going on, but I, I'll do a preemptive apology in case I get booted. If I do, I'll, I'll try to get right back in. But things have been really acting strangely and got another new component coming tomorrow, which hopefully will be the magic, the magic bullet that finally addresses the issues. So, um, and please, I, you know, just like when I'm teaching classes, your only obligation is to, well, I really, we can't have 50 people yelling out questions at once, but John, are you going to kind of curate chat questions and stuff? I'm going to try to, yep. Yeah. So, you know, this, this won't take that long, 20 to 30 minutes for a slideshow, and then we'll kind of open it up to discussions, or if you want to see some iPhone stuff or anything, but let me share my screen here. Boy, we got lots of people pouring in here. Late bloomers, huh? And I'll just do my desktop here and jump over to Keynote, uh, which is right here. And let's go in here. So are you seeing my first screen that says photography? We are. Okay, well, then we're off to a, we're off to a good start, at least. So, um, you know, I always talk about how the history of photography, you know, the oldest print that's surviving is by Nieps. And you can see it down in Austin, Texas. They're not today, perhaps, because they're probably frozen up. But they have that the oldest photo from 1829. So you figure we're just we're just you know eight years less than 200 years the whole history of photography basically. So I always tell people if you're going to do like your PhD in in the history of in in anything any art form do it in photography because you don't have that much history to study. So we've always been about change right from the very beginning. And I always joke that if you you know if you don't like change consider pottery instead. Now of course I've just irritated all the potters in the world, but I think you, you get my point. And I want to talk a little bit here about the transition uh, from classic to digital imaging. And this image, for instance, this is a composite, um, but it is not digital. This was done in the wet, dark room, you know, with multiple enlargers, you know, like Jerry Ulsman, you know, the, just the best ever, and who I just actually got to visit with um, just a year ago this month down in Florida. And I did get to assist Jerry in Yosemite, the dark room there, for a couple of classes. And of course, he became a mentor and all that. So I want to show you some images here. This, for instance, this is one of the, my favorite images in my portfolio. And this dates back to 1983. And there's nothing digital about this. This was shot on Tri-X Processing Paper Developer to pop an intentional grain. And then on the silver print, there was a lot of burning, dodging, bleaching, etching, you know, spotting, everything to make it have the tonality I wanted. Then on a copy stand, I would re-photograph that silver print with four by five copy film or five by seven, in this case, four by five. So I could print it in platinum with all that printing control built in. Uh, so now of course you'd shoot it straight. You'd add the, you'd add the grain digitally, you'd do the tonal control digitally, et cetera. But there's nothing also, nothing digital about this. The sun was blasting right into the lens of a 20 millimeter Nikron, like an F3. Um, and there was flash fill that I used. So you remember those boats, in the background have the same ambient light hitting them as that woman in the foreground. So if I hadn't used flash fill, she would have been silhouetted. And that might've been interesting too, but I think being able to see she's washing her sorry there and the bubbles in the fabric, I think it's more engaging with the flash fill effect. And this dog going to church Paris from 86, there's nothing digital about this. And of course you couldn't make this photo now because the spire of Notre Dame in the background is sadly no longer there. Hopefully it comes back someday. But one thing I want to point out here, if you notice the dog's legs, the left rear leg, dog's legs don't bend that way. That is a camera time effect. 
And I love it when, when photography, when the medium shows its own hand, when it presents to us things that we wouldn't conceptualize, that we wouldn't think about even. And that's just a magical part. And I always tell students and colleagues that it's not called reality, it's called photography. And that's a very different thing. And you know, just yesterday I, was, I searched on the internet and someone's asking 176 bucks for this, this book that I wouldn't, I wouldn't buy. Uh, but this was the second edition, good Lord, but the first edition, maybe they're getting $177 for us or asking. But this does kind of date things. I wrote the first edition of that book, Making Digital Negatives back in on like 94. So and that opened doors for a lot of people to make larger, you know, make contact prints. For instance, this, the, uh, this is a uh, man lifting catfish. Um, he is actually lifting uh, with penis, by the way, is the rest of the title. He was actually lifting 120 pound rock when I photographed him in Nepal. And, and I'm not doing much of that background cemetery stuff anymore because it's just so sinfully easy to do now. But um, he was lifting this rock with this loop of cloth uh, looped over his organ. So it really is leg muscles doing the lifting. And I, I always point out that I've tried to do this cantilever and I can't get above like 14 pounds. But you notice how his, um, how his, the tendons in his neck are standing out. The same thing happens when I tried this. My tendon, but my tongue also comes out of the corner of my mouth. And of course, the pond ripples were made in Photoshop. You know, this, the, uh, the pigs in frozen paradise, uh, this was shot on like Delta 400 down in uh, so old silver mining town in Mexico. There are several pieces to this image that were assembled in Photoshop back in like 94. Um, but, you know, Jill says, I have a talent for making photographs that no one wants to buy. And this is one of them. I've sold a couple of these over the years. And obviously, this will be worth this. Every, any collector would love to have this in their collection in another 25 years. It's just a hard pedal right now. So, um, but the pigs were separate. I photographed them in Tehuantepec in Southern Mexico. The, you know, so they're like three different pieces to this. And of course, this is why you always want to carry a camera. This has become a signature image, the turtle in church, also from like 94, 95. And there are three pieces to this shot on film. And on three consecutive days of a trip through South Texas, uh, the turtle was in the aquarium in Corpus Christi. I did not know that those three separate exposures were going to come together as this image, but looking at the proof sheet, Jeff, you mentioned, you know, proof sheets and the joy of looking at them and Stephen Johnson too, and I, I'm on board with that. So you look at those and then your mind starts working. So the doorway, which was the outside door of a, of a uh, mission in South Texas, uh, the turtle I mentioned was swimming by in an aquarium with T-Max 3200. And then the uh, church was with a 14 millimeter rectilinear sigma lens. And like the shadow was made from the shape of the turtle, of course, because we have to honor, as Jerry Usman would say, shadows and reflections are very important visual clues for depth and dimension in our images. And then, you know, back, well, uh, probably about 17, 18 years ago, I became interested in color. And I think a lot of us who had only worked in the monochromatic area, silver gelatin, one of the historic processes, uh, because a black and white gave us control and we also had malleability with the, with the monochromatic image. And we had archival properties with the monochromatic image. Well, digital addressed that. We have wonderful control now working in Photoshop, et cetera. And we have these wonderful pigments that last forever. But I wasn't ready to give up platinum, so I would run the watercolor paper through an Epson to put a light wash of color down, then hand coat the platinum sensitizer over that. So that border you see there is not like an effect added in Photoshop or something. That's, that's real hand coated platinum. Um, not that there's anything wrong with that, as Seinfeld would say. So the, all the blacks in detail come from the platinum, but the subtle, subtle color comes from the Epson. Uh, there's another pigment over platinum, and I'm not doing much pigment over platinum anymore. And then of course, about 13 years ago, I thought, well, how can I make the platinum process even harder and more expensive? So I thought, well, I'll add some more precious metal. So years before I had printed on some vellums, but I thought, well, I'm gonna go back to vellum and see if I can put like metal leaf, gold leaf, palladium leaf, et cetera, on the back. So this was one of the first ones I did, the Stand of Trees, Texas image, and it became kind of an important image. And then about, oh, six years ago, I was doing a grant project down in Pennsylvania in, in the Amish country. And this was shot with a digital camera, but then of course it was printed as platinum with gold leaf on the back. Uh, here's one, actually one of the little gold, uh, wee gold leaf, uh, wee, wee gold work pieces that Jeff asked about the jewelry that I'm doing now, I uh, use this image, which was stitched on the iPhone from about, oh, I don't know, 20 or 30 images of the single tree in the snow. And here's a, you know, just to show the, 
the platinum with goalie. This is not my image. This is a, an image by Orman Gili, who sadly we lost about a year and a half ago. Um, he passed uh, just from old age. And this is one is this magnificent image of this brownstone with like 30 some models and the Rolls Royce down there. And he had shot this uh, from the opposite side of the street. And he had, he had shot it in color on like Hasselblad. And he wanted to he commission me to do some platinum prints. So these are 20 by 20 inch on about a 36 pound vellum that's varnished. And you know, in the United States, we can only get gold leaf in three and three eighths inch square, tw pure 24 karat. You can get it if you're willing to drop down to like 22 karat, you can get five inch squares, but I like to stay pure on the stuff. Um, so we printed a bunch of these for him. And these are, you know, selling for a lot of money. And I only get like three quarters of what it sells. No, I'm kidding. I get I got peanut well, fair peanuts, but it was all the value was in his image and his signature not in whoever who the person who printed it. But I was certainly honored and just like to show that. And of course, from a digital negative made on an Epson 9900 sitting behind me on, on transparency film. And then after Katrina hit, New or uh, hit the Gulf Coast, Jill and I wanted to go down there and witness how both Mother Nature and governments had failed the people on the Gulf Coast, especially in New Orleans. And, you know, of course, the local government failed, the state government of Louisiana failed, and the federal government failed. When you have people on their rooftops baby begging for help for several days, that's a failure of government, isn't it? Um, but I took the camera inside, and this is like this book ended up being the first book photographed entirely with HDR techniques. And that's the cover image there. Uh, in this church, the pews were not nailed down. This was in the lower ninth ward. You can see those fan blades up on the ceiling that drooped because they were underwater for like between 10 days and two weeks. Um, and then this is like, this is the last image in the book of this uh, church, in a church, the hymnal sitting on a pew. And you can see the way as the water receded, how it, the book wick, uh, wicked away the moisture and the, uh, the mud dried differently right around the book. And you can see in the, in the, 20, I think that, yeah, the print's like 20 by 30. You can see uh, words like mercy and Lord. It's very symbolic. So then, of course, iPhone photography. So I got interested in that back in, in that book, <laughs> iPhone Artistry, came out in like 2012. Um, so, oh, there's someone we can admit. Actually, I can't. My mouse is disabled. I got it. So I'm just going to show you some things from that. And, you know, Jill and I just moved up here in uh, 2007. And I started shooting with the iPhone. I wanted to kind of honor the Hudson River School, you know, America's first own art movement with the, the warm tones and the mountains and the waterways. So these were all shot with the iPhone um, and stylized. This is uh, actually from Florence, where Jill and I were both teaching workshops. And this is an iPhone capture using the sweep pano feature. You know how we hit the button, we, we tilt the or pivot the phone around. So as this boat went down the Arno, I swept in the same direction the boat was moving from right to left. And it stretched out this eight man crew boat into this like 25 or whatever. This is not a digital effect. I think this is an important point. This is photography. If we did this with like a Roblox, you know, one of those pivoting lens cameras or a circuit camera where the lens moved, we'd get the exact same effect. This is photography. And I love, remember what I said that when photography shows its own hand, it's just a magical thing. And that's one of the reasons we cherish the medium. And then I just throw this in for the heck of it. You ever get drunk? So if, now back to the iPhone stuff. This was crossing the George Washington Bridge, shot like a 3G. Uh, I always joke that, you know, I was driving, we were leaving Manhattan, heading to Jersey, and uh, it was raining. And I said, Jill, would you, uh, she was in the passenger seat, and Jill, my wife, I said, will you hold the steering wheel? And she said, I'm not going to hold the steering wheel in the rain going across the George Washington Bridge. I said, well, someone should, because I'm doing photography. So she was a good sport and held it. And of course, this was shot and stylized on the, uh, on the iPhone. Uh, this is printed in gold leaf, the Mexican cowboy in the convenience store down in, uh, in the Sonora area. Um, shot with like an iPhone 4. And yeah, I mentioned the gold leaf and that last one was gold leaf. This is the first image where I started mixing metals to apply to the back of the print. And on the water, something, you know, like Charlie Brown says, donate the yellow snow for good, for good reason. Well, yellow water, this is the Hudson Valley. This was taken from an airplane. It was preparing to land down in Newburgh. Um, yellow water, it looks like pea. So I started grinding together gold with palladium to get a softer, less yellow kind of metal. So I applied that mixture of powder, would put the size, which in the gilding world is the word for adhesive, on the back of the vellum, put that mixture on the water area, and then put 24 karat gold uh, on the rest of the image for that. 
Um, that's an iPhone capture from Venice where I was doing an iPhone workshop. And this is just down the road from us here, the uh, canoe, or excuse me, cabins under blue moon. And of course we know a blue moon just is the second occurrence of a blue moon in a month. There's nothing blue or special about it otherwise. And this is kind of, there's a nice little short story about this image. I shot this in 2001 in the Czech Republic and was writing a review for the Nikon Coolpix 5000, which is the first little uh, a five megapixel guy, or was that four? What was that? It was a breakthrough, whether it was four or five, I think it was five megapixel. And, you know, I, I could never bring it to fruition like in Photoshop. And then about four years ago, I airdropped it back over to the uh, iPhone and took it through some apps. And one other thing I did, the aspect ratio of the iPhone is three by four. So I squeezed it down. You could do that in Photoshop too, but squeezed it down from three by four to three by three. So everything in there is like 25% narrower and it gives it a little bit of a Flemish painting kind of effect. Uh, and the additional tonal and texture control, which is just so wonderfully accessible uh, via iPhone apps and processing. So I could bring that image to life that I couldn't, uh, couldn't on the Mac with other digital control, at least at that time. Uh, this was shot with an iPhone 5, 8 megapixel. We have a 20 by 30 inch print hanging upstairs of this. Now we're at 12 megapixel. And remember, we've been at 12 megapixel on the iPhone since the 6S. And I'm not going to do the math to figure when the 6S was a new camera, but it was a number of years ago. But even though it's the same number of pixels, the optics have become better, the sensor has become better, and the processing because of the faster chips has become monstrously better. So it's not the same kind of image we get from, from 12 megapixel that we got back on the iPhone 6S. And here's what I want to talk about resolution. This is the final way I present this. This is Factory and Creek at dusk. And I want to show you how this started. There's the original shot out of the car window driving up the, up the throughway. And that little, whatever, that cement plant or something there in the background. So if you do the math, this was 8 megapixel with like an iPhone 4 or something. If you divide this in quarters, you'd be down to 2. And divide that in quarters, and you're down to like half. There's probably about you know, between a third and a half a megapixel in this image. So I always tell people, you know, there's a tendency we want to quantify everything. Um, so we're, we're, not, we're not trying to make numerically perfect photographs. We're trying to make photos with some spirit and soul. And sometimes that means every little be bit of detail rendered beautifully and wonderfully. And other times it means something more ethereal. And it's all fair, but don't get hung up on the number of megapixels. Uh, this is one, it was shot with a bigger camera, I kind of like micro four thirds because of its size and everything. Um, so I shot this, but then wi fi it over to the iPhone and squeezed this one down uh, from three by four uh, to three by three. And so this is, uh, everything in there is 25% narrower and it makes it work. It's amazing how many images will have almost a Tolkien-esque quality when you squeeze them down. And then there were texturizing effects applied. Uh, this is a shot up on Lake Superior when I was teaching a workshop up there, this hiker out on this little rock jutting out over Lake Superior. And then I just throw this in because some of you said, oh, that texture bullshit and stuff that he does, I'm not going to do it. And that's, that's fine. Uh, it's like, kind of like the, uh, the little tin man here, you know, he couldn't get into the Pilates class too much. So he's kind of dismissing that. So I understand if, if, if you're not into this stuff. Um, back a number of years ago, I was commissioned by the city of Buffalo to just come up and I only put a couple in here of images about Buffalo. Um, and these are, this actually is printed with uh, moon gold, which is a mixture of 24 karat gold, uh, silver and palladium on the back. And it really gives a moon gold, it's really beautiful. Sometimes 24 karat gold, the yellowness can overpower the image. So things like white gold and moon gold are beautiful alloys that are a little more, more forgiving in terms of subject matter. I'm just gonna show you a few of those from that Buffalo project. And then traveling with a camera. I mean, uh, of course, in the last year, you know, no one's been doing much traveling. But I wanted to show you some. We've been to Cuba now eight times. I just want to show you some of the images from Cuba. And the last time we went, I was shooting with this uh, on Micro Four Thirds with this Kawa six millimeter. It's actually a lens made for closed circuit TV, and it's manual focus and manual aperture and all that stuff. It has no electrical contacts, but it's wonderful. It's just a wonderful. I mean, it's got vignette and it's got distortion, and it's, I just love it. And it's such a tiny little thing. I'd set an f5.6 hyperfocal and you don't worry, you just, you just take pictures. So it's kind of like a departure from the concerns that sometime are an artistic negative. So I'm just gonna show you a few. This was also shot with that six millimeter in this mechanic shop there in, outside of Havana. 
Uh, this was this was not the six millimeter, but I did crop this down to be a pano. This beautiful mural painted on this wall, and these kids, and it's just so fortuitous that the ball. I got the bounce of the ball when it was you know off the ground with the shadow underneath. Um, and you know, the first time we went, we're shooting with a seventeen point five millimeter uh, Nocton f point nine five. You know, it was one of the first f point nine five. So that's like a thirty five millimeter on full frame. And in this picture, the only light source at night in this barber shop was that fluorescent light up on the wall there. And just um, almost operatic in terms of the, the gesture and everything. I just love this. They were not pausing. You know, the guy was just cutting his hair and it was just a you know happy time to click the shutter. I'll show you a few others. Um, this is a platinum print of this hanging in the Arlington Museum of Art right now for the street shooter show. So this was shot wide open, a 1.2 lens, and it's just a... I just love the way that guy just turned and looked down at the camera right as I clicked the shutter. Sometimes, sometimes the spirits of composition and gesture and expression all work in your favor. And this was down in Trinidad, Cuba, uh, the fire breather. And you talk about contrast because that, the flame was really the only light source in that room. So I shot a burst bracketed and then with an app on the iPhone, melded those three bracketed shots together just on the iPhone with JPEGs. And it just turned out magnificent. And so I thought, well, this, this looks nice. How can I bring out the feeling of the flame? So I thought, well, I'll print this with gold leaf. And I actually put with, uh, use glass bead gel on the back of the print in the flame area. So through the vellum, it catches these little, little tiny glass beads, capture the light uh, and make the fire feel, the flame feel more alive. And then the gold's behind that. It's really kind of a fun thing. I show students how to do that. And then Romania, you know, one of the, one of our new uh, love spots is, is Romania. And we were supposed to have gone like two times, you know, during COVID. But I have been there a couple times. I just want to show you some images from there um, with the Roma, the the uh, the gypsies, just wonderful people to work with and gracious. They had us into their home and just uh, so wonderful to photograph. I'll just show you a few others. Hot, hot shoeing a horse. And this is, this looks, it's not painful to the animal at all. It's actually better for the animal because they're heating this shoe, the metal shoe up like red hot and it burns into the cuticle and the cuticle is just like when you clip your nails you don't feel anything same thing for the horse but it actually seats with no high spots so it stinks because of the smoke but it's really um, a very good way to do it and it's just wonderful to see them do that in the regard they have for the animals this is just one of my favorites with this uh, narrow gauge train going by and this fellow i'm just so glad he came out on the on that bridge to watch the train go by so i could could get this shot as the steam train went by there. And this, this is just, uh, I love this shot. Uh, it's another time when those, you know, the, we mentioned the gods of gesture and tonality and everything. Like every, I love the way everyone is looking like in a different direction in this photo with this lady confronting the camera. And I was out moving with the parade. This is called Parade Watchers of uh, Romania. So I was walking along with the parade shooting um, and these were behind the rope on the side looking out. And it's just, I, I, it's one of my favorite images of recent. And then the boy on Christmas day in Romania who just come out of church, they got their formal woolies on, that's what they call them. And, you know, using the, uh, using one of the things nice about mirrorless, you can tilt the, tilt the LCD up. So I like to shoot kind of at waist level. So he, I find if I wiggle my fingers, kids will look at motion. So I just wiggle my fingers next to the lens and rather than his look at me, he'll be looking at the, right into the lens and got this right as he kind of confronted the lens there with that wonderful expression on his face. And then this was on Christmas day in a wooden church and was up in the balcony. And boy, I couldn't have done this with a DSLR because with a silent shutter, not reduced sound shutter, but completely silent, I was able to shoot wide open at 1.2 with a 25 millimeter, which there again is like 50 on full frame and get this beautiful shallow depth of field and not get kicked out of the church for having a clanging, banging, crashing shutter sound. So it's just wonderful to be able to do that kind of shooting now with our mirrorless. And the narrow gauge train right as it was pulling out of the, uh, out of the place that the engineer came over and kind of wiped this condensed steam off the window and looked out right as I clicked the shutter for that shot. And uh, walked over into Ukraine, and uh, which is sort of topical. Um, and this, this uh, merchant, the owner of the little shop was just having a great time talking to us. And I was shooting kind of clandestinely there again, silent shutter, um, not even not even having the viewfinder or the uh, LCD folded out, just uh, shooting silent shutter and just hitting the shutter and kind of seat of the pants aiming it and crop this down to square. And uh, the blacksmith was with his horse. What kind of camera were you using with that silent shutter? 
Um, that, at that time, it would have been like a EM1 Mark II, probably. That's Olympus? Um, yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. Yes, Olympus. Yeah. Yeah. And of course, Olympus was just bought, purchased by this. Uh, it's now called, what's it called? OM Solution, Digital Solutions. And it looks like they're going to do some good stuff with it. I hope so, because I sure like the, like the media. This was shot with a lens baby lens. You got to love lens baby. And for years now, they've been doing this, this wonderful stuff with funky optics, but controlled funkiness. And this was one of the few they made just for micro four thirds called the Soul, like Sun, S-O-L. And this was the Soul 22. So it was like a 44 millimeter lens. Uh, during this bear parade, and they had these, they used to have real bears. Now th these people put these bear costumes on over there. And this guy was taking a break and he'd just taken the bear costume off. And so this effect is from that, that, uh, that uh, lens baby that you can kind of bend around to get just the right effect. And you really see why they're called Romanian. Th does he look Roman? I mean, look at that profile, isn't it magnificent? So I just love shooting with that there. Of course, it's slower, you know, because it's not autofocus or anything. And then Vietnam in 2019, uh, uh, led with another person, a group to Vietnam. I'll just show you a few pictures there, which is a beautiful country, uh, some of the landscapes and things. And um, in this, this is a little quad shot coming up. Aren't the colors beautiful there with that train going by and the tents and with the awnings and things? Now in here, let's start with the upper left, number one. That's the remnants. This is in Hanoi of a B-52 that we shot down during the Christmas bombing in 72 and crash there and you can see the tire is still there so all this time it really speaks well to how rubber holds up but this is part of the wing and the tire and everything from this b72 the number two in the upper right that's sort of a you can it's really propaganda from a you know from a communist perspective about how they defeated the imperialists and everything uh you know it's partially true i guess the lower left that picture me and i'm sorry i don't remember the lady's name uh, but her husband was killed in December 72 when that B-72 crashed. And it was just a real honor to get to meet her. And then number four in the lower right is my mug shot um, from a year earlier. And I was in prison and actually I was in the prison hospital during that bombing, uh, mm. doing a hunger strike. I was a war resistor during the Vietnam War and refused induction into the armed forces. And I got no problem with the people who went, um, but it was, it was not the right thing for some of us. So that's kind of just an interesting little uh, little scenario there. Uh, then just a couple of years ago, I got this grant. Uh, New York still has some money for the artists. They might not anymore after COVID. But, um, and my wife, Jill, has also gotten a grant for, she did a beautiful project with, uh, with a trail camera in the woods and dealing with trappers and hunters and everything. It was just super. But I got this grant for, for kind of documenting the, the plow crews. And I only put a few of the images in here, but I documented the workers in the office, both male and female, who make stuff happen. But these are the people that keep our roads safe. And um, I'm just going to show you a few of these from the Snowplow Project. And I'll go through these quickly. The obligatory uh, drone shot. And Ron Sherman, who was just so gracious. I went out a couple times in the truck with, with Ron and the drivers were just great to work with. And this is the last image in the little series. And I'm obligated to kind of put this up, you know, where the money came from, from the uh, Council of the Arts, et cetera. So, um, and then just a little over a year ago at Christmas and New Year's uh, with Joe Brenzo, a really good friend who lives down in, in San Miguel, we were doing a workshop in Oaxaca. And we're going to try to do one again, if it's safe, this October for Day of the Dead instead of for Christmas with the radish festival, but isn't that an amazing radish? That's just one radish. And that's not a really big one that they had dug up for this, this special time when they grow these gigantic radishes. But really what I got into and mostly with several different lenses, I'm um, gonna show you, this was with that six millimeter cowl, which I just, I just love so much, a little tiny lens. Uh, and then like this image was with a, a this is a 97 year old Cook Knick. It's a, uh, a 25 millimeter lens, so it's like a normal 50, and it's a 1.5. It's a cinema lens made back in like the, you know, like the early 30s or late 20s or something for 16 millimeters. So when you use it on micro four thirds, you're getting into that edge goodness that wasn't really intended to hit 16 millimeter film, but it hits the micro four third sensor. Uh, so this is a fellow with a bubble gun as someone's approaching the camera. And this is that, that cowl lens. They had no idea I was photographing them, but I just love that shot of that group of friends in front of the cathedral. And that's with the 25 Cook Connect, which is just, it's got the petsful swirliness to the background. I always shoot it wide open at 1.5. 
Uh, so that one you do have to, it's, you can't hyperfocal that one as easily and that, that would lose some of the joy. So you do have to pay some attention to manual focusing with that guy. And that's that, that six millimeter cowl again, which I got from B&H as a brand new lens. And then also have this uh, uh, 50 millimeter Zeiss. It's from an old Zeiss, uh, a contacts range finder from back like 90 some years ago and got a micro four thirds mount for it. And it's just, it's beautiful. It's also a one five and wide open. It's just so creamy, you could die for it. Uh, and this was shot with the, uh, with that 50 millimeter Zeiss at 1.5. And then you got this little series that we're right towards the end and I'll, we'll do questions or iPhone fun or whatever you want. Back when I was in elementary school and then even in junior high, I really loved my microscope. This is like a Porter Chemical was in our hometown down in Maryland. And this was like, this is not my actual microscope. But it's a picture of like my very first little microscope. And I would come home from school and spend hours looking at things through the microscope. So just a year ago, I got kind of interested and got a um, microscope on Amazon. And um, so I started shooting with the iPhone through a little $25 adapter that would go on the, on the tube, you know, so you could shoot with the iPhone through there. And you can fire the shutter with your Apple Watch. That's a wonderful thing for no vibration. You know, your Apple Watch is a viewfinder. You can tap to focus and fire the shutter so you get no vibration. Wonderful way to shoot. Um, so there's like a paramecium probably having lunch. Um, so I thought, well, what can I do about these? I mean, we've seen, you know, paramecium and stuff before. That's kind of cliche. You see the vacuoles inside. So I thought, well, I'll do some, I'll do it on vellum, do some gold leaf. I thought, well, that's kind of cool. Um, so I thought, well, what am I going to do with this? So, so then I thought, well, I'll do something different. So I'm actually embedding the vellum with gold leaf prints in resin. So I was doing these three by nine. This is a three by nine inch because I wanted to honor that the, the, the microscope slide is a one to three aspect ratio. So I kind of wanted to honor that aspect ratio for the presentation in the resin. And I thought, well, that's kind of neat. What else can I do? So then I started, I built a mold. So this is a mold out of foam core and the glass is, uh, is like the, uh, making the form in there. And I pour the special uh, molding rubber stuff in there that sets up. And then you, then you pour the resin in. And so then there's one example. So these are one foot by three foot with the, um, with the resin or the gold leaf uh, print in there. And that's of like a, uh, I think it's a, uh, a pollen uh, grain or something in that one there. So you can see that example. And then Jeff <laughs> asked about the We Gold work. So just a couple of months ago, Joe and I were talking, and I want to, you know, I want to, I love the small print, like Jeff said. So how can I do these? So we're doing these pendants and things. So I'm taking images and printing them on vellum and putting gold leaf and white gold and sometimes palladium. So I'll just show you a few of these. So there's how I'm doing it. So the size, the which is the word for adhesive, remember. So I'm applying the gold leaf to the back of the of the little one inch print in this case, and then it's put into the into the um, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? The form for it. And then of course there's a, a cabochon, which is the dome glass. And boy, you put that dome glass on top and it's like putting a lens on top of the image and it gives a certain wonderful distortion and the way it bends light. It really, it's something you gotta see in person. You can't really witness it too well in here. And so this is like on a little model thing here with the earring. These are just 12 millimeters in diameter of the dog in snow. And that's from the Czech Republic back in, in, 2000, in uh, 2001. And uh, it, it, people seem to take a liking to these things. That's got white gold behind it in that case. So I've gotten down to 12 million. There's one from Ireland, excuse me, Scotland. Uh, that would be a one inch uh, pendant in white gold. And then this is like a little special edition thing we just did uh, about a month ago, a New York series. So these are one inch squares. And these are the only ones I've done that are a mixture. So you can see these are split tone with gold and then palladium leaf. And remember palladium is much more expensive than gold or, or platinum at this point. And we put those in this little case and they're, they're kind of anchored on this kind of carbonized rattan little stick and it uh, held in place by these little tiny O-rings. It's really, really a really uh, nice little presentation. And here you can kind of see a, a wide angle kind of shot or an angular shot from those. And um, okay, we're at the end here. And I always like to close up by talking about the value of our per, the personal photos we make. You know, we assign so many jobs to photography from whack out, you know, Cindy Sherman art stuff to pure journalism. And most of us fall somewhere in between those extremes. But the most important photos are not in galleries, they're not in museums. And like I said, they certainly aren't in my portfolio. And I'm gonna show you a, like a photo that's very important to me on a personal level. This is my mom and sister and me back in like 87 or something 
in Egypt when we met up there. And this this just has so much meaning to me. And it looks like the wind was blowing. It looks like I was doing a John Kennedy thing back when I had hair or something was blowing. But you know, whatever you do, don't stop making personal photos. They're just one of the most important uses for our medium that you can imagine. And then this is, we're gonna close up here, words to live by. This is an actual fortune cookie. I've shown this so many times, but I love closing with this. Uh, Jill and I were at a Chinese restaurant a number of years ago, and I got this one. I said, Jill, you gotta hold this. I can't believe this is real. So here it is. You are capable, competent, and creative, prove it. It was a challenge cookie. So this is your, my challenge to you, you know, starting with this cookie that we assume you're capable, competent, and creative. Now your job is to prove it. And there's a self-portrait done with an app on the phone and that winds it up there. So that's all I got in here, but we can go into all kinds of other stuff. So Great. thanks and I'll stop, stop sharing here. Thank uh, you for sharing this. Uh, oh so yeah, of, yeah. A couple of questions have popped up. Um, let's see. Um, Ashton was saying, would you, would I ask Dan about printing images on glass and doing the gold leaf behind it? Kate Brakey does this and I wonder if you've tried it uh, with the image uh, being printed in inkjet on glass. I have not. Kate Brakey is a wonderful example and an amazing artist from Texas. And, um, oh, who's the other person that borrowed the, well, not borrowed, but did a beautiful thing from, uh, oh, uh, not, oh, not Jill Enfield. She does other beautiful work. I'm drawing a blank, but. Um, several artists are using glass. I have not done glass, mm -hmm. um, but I mean, that's one way you don't get the, the wrinkle effect, um, but it's a, certainly a wonderful way you can explore the same kind of process, absolutely. Yeah, my brother-in-law, Ted Pruce, does platinum prints on uh, leaf skeletons. He coats the Neat. leaf skeleton and the prints onto that. Well, leaf skeletons are really wonderful to work with here. That's super. So your, your textures, do you create your own textures? Uh, very infrequently. Um, you know, like one of our favorite iPhone apps that a lot of people use is Distressed FX, and it mm -hmm. lets you bring in your own texture. You don't have to settle for their canned textures. And some of their textures, that's one of my gripes is you can't randomize the texture. It comes in the same way with the same marks. It's like mm -hmm. a tell, right? For like the, the poker player who touches their nose every time they have a, a good hand. Um, so it'd be nice if they added that randomized thing. But um, you can bring in your own textures. In fact, when one of these, some of these Cuba trips where we photograph these dancers at this one beautiful mansion, and we're not the only ones that go, a lot of groups mm -hmm. go to shoot dancers, but the mansion itself is wonderful. And there's a stone like foundation all the way around with all these lichens and mosses and things. Some people said, just take five minutes to just walk around the building and photograph these and have your, have your own little arsenal of textures that you can use, whether it's in Photoshop or an iPhone app to, to overlay on your images. Mm -hmm. So let's see, I got an email. Someone was asking, what are the best printers to use, the best negative film to use, and light boxes? Oh, light boxes and film, I'm not the person to ask. Okay. I mean, we got lots of, lots of experts here that would be better to, uh, to address something like that. And printers, I mean, you know, Canon's given Epson a good run for their money, but we, there again, you know, we got Steve, Jeff and Steve here, uh, real experts in the printing world. Um, you know, I think for people who live in low humidity areas, you know, high out to like, uh, whether it's New Mexico or Colorado, there are big pluses for the Canon there because they seem a little less clog prone uh, owing to head drying. But I'm kind of in the Epson, you know, world. So yeah. uh, I, I just kind of stick with Epson, but certainly I understand. Think, I think the best printer that you can, um, that you can uh, have is the one that you actually own and can print on. <laughs> um, well, like asking, well, asking what well, printer to buy is like you have with you. Yeah, let's Stephen. Yeah, yeah. Let's uh, Stephen. I'm just saying it's it's like the the best camera you have is the one you have with you. It's the same sort of idea. And if you don't have a camera with you, you take neurochromes. Yeah. <laughs> I like that. That's a good word, John. <laughs> uh, let's see. I was also asked: Are you holding any online or in-person classes this coming year? You know, oh, does a, hub, does a hobby horse have a hickory dick? I mean, yes, of course. I mean, that's an East Coast colloquialism. Um, but, but yeah, it is. <laughs> but yeah, yeah I mean, that. <laughs> but I've used that so many times over the so many times over the years. It's it's sinful. But um, but yeah, we don't want to take ourselves too seriously, right? 
So yeah, in fact, tomorrow, um, well, I did a class this morning earlier on digital negatives because people still want to learn that. It's still a very vi you know great thing to be able to you know not have to use a big camera and go into the dark room and make prints on any you know whether whether it's platinum, palladium, cyanotype, Van Dyke salt print or anything like that where you need a, a you know a contact print. And tomorrow I'm doing a class. We've actually we got it. If you go to danberkler.com, you can see the class. I'm doing one tomorrow. It's full, uh, but we got some scheduled in March where I'm actually teaching how to do the gold leaf. Not the jewelry thing, that's a different thing. Uh, but this is making gold leaf prints, like, well, say like here, I can hold, here's, here's a small one up here. Um, let me just try to hold that where you're not getting too much of a reflection. So, you know, things like that on, on the vellum. But you can do them with, that was a platinum print, but you can, behind glass, the printers are so good, our inkjet printers, behind glass, you're not, there's a hocus pocus, pocus mythology to platinum. And I like to dispel that because, you know, I understand, you know, a handmade print is a very special thing. It's sort of like handmade handmade furniture versus machine-made jewelry. They're not the same thing, though they made to the layman look, lay person look the same. But the reality is a lot of us don't have access to that room. So by make, being able to use an inkjet printer to print on the vellum, but then still then go into that arena of being able to apply precious metals and it turns it into a whole different thing. And it does help your work. It elevates you out of that, that, you know, we're kind of drowning in an ocean of inkjet prints. Just like, you know, 25 years ago, we were drowning in an ocean of silver gelatin prints. So it's not automatically bad. It's just kind of like where we are. So yeah, so the short answer is, yeah, I teach all kinds, all kinds of stuff online. So we were, you know, so many of us were, were pushed into this owing to COVID and it's turned out to be a, a great avenue to reach out to audiences that may not have been available otherwise. So folks in the audience, feel free to jump in with some questions or post them in the chat and I will ask for you. Um, but I just posted the link to Dan's website in the chat. Oh, oh thanks, John. So Dan, um, yeah. where, are, where and how are some of the ways you market your prints and items and so forth? Are they in- Well, the, the uh, We Gold Works is on Etsy. And you know, the- uh, it's been a sad story over the past few years. You know, the, the galleries are having a rough time. I mean, I've lost multiple galleries. They've closed. Um, you know, it's just a, a bad time in the gallery world. So I'm not a good per I'm not a good person to talk about marketing. For the We Gold Works, that we can market as jewelry on an Etsy, that's worked out pretty well. I mean, you take pictures of the stuff, you write it up honestly and accurately, and uh, and then you know you use. I think Facebook is a great marketing tool, actually. Uh, I wouldn't get my political advice from there, but <laughs> certainly I think you can reach a, reach an audience and sell things. But in terms of, we don't, I don't sell that many prints. I'll have, I'll have collectors approach me privately and buy, but I'm not really selling many prints otherwise. And in workshops, of course, you always sell prints to workshop students, but now we're only working, you know, uh, via virtually versus, versus with via Zoom. So that changes that equation too. So don't, that a don't little change. That'll all change. All of that will change. Well, let's let's hope lots of things change, right? Well, they're they're going to be forced to change because of what this past year has done. Uh, I yeah. mean, um, um, certainly, uh, shoe stores are are a, a dying um, are a dying breed because right now you can call up any shoe manufacturer. Uh, or uh, online, and they'll send you uh, six to seven or eight pairs of, of their shoes. And if you don't like any of them, you just send it back, no charge. Oh, really? They'll, they'll send you that many, like different sizes, so you can pick the one that fits the best? Bingo. Wow, that's cool, because that would be an issue of a proper fit. Yeah, and the gentlemen's clubs have been, you know, you can't go to those anymore. And I had a question about... Uh, <laughs> yeah. your your experience uh, as a war resistor. You showed the one photograph from Hanoi, which I thought was really pretty moving. And we've talked about this, you know, over the years, many times, the deep admiration I have for what you did. I wonder if there's other artwork that you've made over the years having to do with that uh, whole experience. Oh, thanks for asking, Steve. Um, you know, I've always had a hard time kind of combining, you know, I don't more important moral rather than political uh, kind of am, ambitions and concerns with my artwork. I, I can I, I wish I could do better at that. 
It's hard but to do. I have not. Yeah, it is. It is. Oh, there's Rufus. I see Rufus over here. He must have dug out of his 10 inches of snow. <laughs> and that's <laughs> that's that's for asking, Steve. Show, show some more if things come to mind. I'm curious. And we can do that offline, too. Okay. Yeah, how much how much time did you spend in prison? A year and a half. Wow. <laughs> I'd spent a little time in a couple a couple county jails before that. You know, you got to go, you know, on your way to the federal joint, you got you go through a couple county jails too. So you wrote your book about mobile photography, iPhone artistry back in 2012. Were you anticipating where mobile photography would be now with computational photography? Well, I mean with like with the with the iPhone 12s, the new their night mode and this deep fusion, which is actually taking nine photos. You know, the last one when you hit the shutter, that's the ninth photo. It's automatically spooling and taking the other eight. When you hit the shutter, that's the ninth and longest exposure. And on a pixel by pixel basis, assembling that image, it's hard to imagine other camera manufacturers being able to compete with that because Apple's supposed to have something like I ah, you, you hear these rumors like 240 engineers just working on the camera module who knows if that's accurate but you know it's probably they probably got a better budget than Nikon or Canon or Olympus does right so yeah you know, are they going to be able to match that and, and once you know when we have the periscope camera with the folded optical path meaning we have better telephotos instead of you know like, instead of like 65 millimeter equivalent where we have you know 150 200 and once that the synthetic bouquet matches optical bouquet, that's going to be, a, um, there are going to be two more nails in the bigger camera coffin, aren't they? Yeah. Um, so, I mean, we've already lost, you know, the whole point and shoot world that's vaporized owing to smartphones. And, um, you know, let's face it, this, uh, like it or not, I think these in the long run are going to be good for photography. The issue becomes, you know, as it's, let's, photography is easier than it's ever been. So how do you how do you stand out? That's gonna so you're gonna have to tap into your your you know our, your creative urges and impulses, find ways to express that more powerfully than ever. And you might have to try a different way of printing your images or presenting. And we may be sculpting with gamma rays in ten years. You know, we might give up the who knows we'll give up the visible spectrum perhaps. Um, that's the beauty of photography. We we don't we never really know what's coming next. But the um, difference, but the difference is that no matter how you make the print after you uh, capture the image, the bottom line is still the image, not what yeah. not what you went through to, to 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 have to create it. It still has to be uh, the image. Compelling. The image is the last thing. Yeah, we can't lose track of the image itself. I agree 100%. Yeah, I don't care if you make it with uh, uh, palladium or with uh, gold or with, uh, you know, uh, diamonds, diamond dust. If the, picture looks, that, like a, if the, <laughs> if the picture looks like a pile of crap, it's still going to be a pile of crap with diamond dust on it. Uh, well, that's, that's, who cares about that? <laughs> Other you know, than that, who though, cares what camera it came from? That's right. That's absolutely right. I kind of can and do. The what? Only the photographer. The camera cares. manufacturers care. Absolutely. So does Sony. I mean, they all do. Absolutely. You're, and, so, Michael, so what Dan, you're really I have saying, a question. What you're really saying is it's the seduction of the image. The image that seduces you is what really matters. That's, That's right. That's exactly right. Yeah. Absolutely right. So, and, Dan, and, I have and, a question and a comment. Yes, sir. The question, you said bouquet instead of boca. How do you pronounce boca? Well, Lacan. you know, you know <laughs> we're not going to have an argument on this. I mean, we don't, you know, we're not going to have a yes, pissy match. Yes, we can. We can settle it by arm wrestling. <laughs> but it, it, from what I've read, it seems like bouquet from, you know, from the Japanese or something is the correct way, but I don't care. You know, if you want to, okay. well, no, you just said which pronunciation. You said bouquet, and I was like, bouquet? What the hell is he talking about? Flowers? And then I translated that to boca. Well, we um, can take a vote here and see what people like. Yeah. Well, Let's not. The, yes. Uh, the other thing I was going to ask you is uh, where the hell is Elmo? Mm. Because and one of uh, Dan's good friends 
And um, a, f a friend of mine from the old days, uh, Elmo Sapwater. You got to just love anybody whose name is Elmo Sapwater. Well, you gotta love it. Dan you gotta love and it. Elmo uh, <laughs> apparently, apparently occasionally get loose and go out traveling together and get into all kinds of trouble. But I was hoping Elmo would be here today. No, no, son. Elmo's, you know, he's got his own projects going right now. So I think I've taken up a lot of his time. So he's, he's, you know, concentrating on that and maybe he's avoiding you. <laughs> I'm sorry. Is he what? Avoiding. Oh, oh, is he no, avoiding I just, you? I just, I just talked to him this morning when I was, you know, driving home from front of some errands and no, he, he's doing great. Okay. Please send our greetings to him, Dan, because oh. a lot of us care a lot yeah. about him. Well, yeah. Well, that'll touch him. That'll mean a lot to him. So thanks. Now, yeah, I sure will. We, we miss a lot of that camaraderie and Elmo is definitely an old friend that I miss. Oh, yeah. He's got quite a history in, in all of our, you know, side worlds, doesn't he? That's exactly right. Well, I got to tell you, John, Elmo would be a really <laughs> interesting person to have come on uh, for a conversation if you could get him to like stick in one place for an hour, it's tough. A tough one, yes. Yeah, I'd agree, he'd be great. <laughs> that shut everyone up. <laughs> what is he, in a witness protection program? He moves around a lot? What, is, what does he do? <laughs> so Dan. It's secret. Yeah. What do you see as future projects for yourself? Oh, um, well, you know that they always say that don't talk about your projects because the discussion becomes an end in itself. So there are some different things happening, but uh, photographic things happening. But I don't really want to get into them. But you know, it, I think having a test attempt attention deficit disorder really helps. You know, I always joke that you know my wife says I have attention deficit disorder, but I've never she could be right. I've never thought about it long enough. That's one of my standing, <laughs> you, know, you know, standing jokes. You know. It's like, take my wife, please. But, um, but it does, you know, it does kind of push you to look for something new and different. And, and for me, that kind of validates, you know, I think many of us were drawn to photography because it so effectively combines the artistic and the technical. And that's been a real, that's a tickle factor for a lot of us, isn't it? Uh, in ways that perhaps painting or sculpture wouldn't be. So, um, and you know, leaning, always trying to kind of go to the next step and find, and especially putting the old and the new together. That's always a that's always enjoyable when you can do that. Because I love some of the the art, the uh, classic parts of photography, but yet blended in with some of the the new stuff. Hey, if at any point, if you want to see a couple things on the iPhone, I'm happy to do some dog and pony things here too, John. So it's sure, whatever. Sure, oh, I was just okay. wondering if you see Cuba opening up again, besides well, the pandemic. Yeah, um, you know, it's it's what's happening on our end and what's happening on that end. And, of course, they've been hit really hard with the tourism decrease. And, of course, you know, we had administration policies that certainly mm -hmm. didn't help the people of Cuba. Um, so we're hoping there's there's a reversal on that. But the virus has to, we got to flush that out with, you know, with vaccine availability and everything else. So we're hoping we can go back maybe at the end of the year sometime. Um, mm -hmm. We'll just have to wait and see, but it's a, it's a wonderful, you know, to, to have such a dynamically different colorful culture just 90 miles off our I southern know. coast. It's, it's an amazing opportunity. When, when and Mr. D, don't forget to add Mongolia into that. Oh, yes, uh, Anya. <laughs> yeah, in fact, I showed your image in the digital aid class this morning, Anya. So thanks. Yeah, are you you're real, uh, is your heat on there, Anya? You look bundled up. Uh, no, um, we don't have electricity since eight o'clock this morning, and inside no. now it's sixty degrees. So Texas not good. Texas house not good for this weather. <laughs> oh yeah, no, this is a freakish thing. So I hope you your your power is still off. Yeah, the center point said that if, um, it might kind of continue throughout the day. Oh, well, good luck. I hope you weather this uh, and your power yeah, comes back. Yeah, I have soon. a Mongolian Kashmir, so I'm safe. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I'm, yeah I'm, I'm in Dallas. <laughs> I'm in Dallas also. My power went out about 3 a.m. and came on about oh. 10 minutes ago. Yeah. Oh, good luck. Good luck. Good luck. Good luck. luck to you. Yeah. Oh, boy. It's about yeah, 2 million people in Kansas that are without power. 
hmm. in, can, in, the, in the Kansas and the surrounding area, there's over 2 million people without power, and they won't be getting it back till like Wednesday or Thursday. Yeah. Hmm. So, Dan, where are you? Um, you know, upstate New York. We're two hours above Manhattan. We have one stoplight in our little town of Palinville. If you know where Woodstock, New York is, we're 20 minutes from Woodstock. Okay. I, I spent a summer in Florida, New York. I got, I'm done with it. I used to live in Wappingers Falls. <laughs> oh, yeah, just, just south. Yep, great. Yeah, the Hudson Valley is a beautiful place, isn't it? Okay, well, let me, I'll share my screen again yeah, here. Please. Yeah, let's just have some fun. And I'm going to share iPhone via cable. I'm glad my internet has not choked. So let's see, is this going to come? Yeah, there we go. So, um, you know, Snapseed is just such the wonderful, you know, like do e nearly everything app. And I just want to show you something. Let's here, let's open here. I'll, well, first of all, I'm going to show you something kind of cool. Instead of opening a photo, oh, here, let's do this. Yeah, here's a, you know, the, using live photo. We've got a couple examples here. Um, let me turn this iPhone sideways. You're all seeing this little waterfall shot from, this is from Greenville, South Carolina. And this was shot with live photo on the iPhone. So if I lift up on it, we can choose these different, oh, you, oh, yeah, I'm gonna have to hold this way so you see the titles. So if I do, see, I can choose these different ways of process. So if I do bounce, then we get into this mode where it's like gravity reverses, you know, where the water goes back and forth. But here's the, here's the one that's cool is long exposure. Now live photo on the iPhone just puts a little bit of video capture at the beginning and the end of your still. And so we can exploit that with a live photo. It takes that, that video footage and look at that. And you get that silkiness. So handheld, you're able to get the effect that you need a tripod for, well, at least back in the DSLR days. Uh, before we had good stabilization. So that's just a wonderful thing that you can do uh, without carrying a tripod. And this shot, this was uh, two years ago down in Mexico, this other group that was teaching. And I shot this in live photo and this is on bounce. And I didn't know I was gonna get this effect. I, I was holding the camera kind of high to do this group shot, you know, to get uh, uh, Guanajuato behind them, which is a beautiful city. And I think I must've, as I hit the shutter, I must've been tilting the camera and when I put it in bounce mode, we get this wonderful thing. So no apps or anything, just shooting with in live photo mode and then choosing bounce later, which is pretty cool. Now, here's what I want to show you. If I want to process, say, this, this grant-worthy picture of this, this uh, elevator here. So I'm going to hit the share button down here and copy this. Just hit copy. Now, here's why I'm showing you this. A, a lot of us have been, been here where you want to work on an image that's way up in your photos. I mean, I have like 67,000 photos in my, you know, in my camera roll here. And sometimes you'll be scrolling, scrolling, and say, you know, you scroll, 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 say, oh, that's the one I want to edit. And let's see, I remember it's two pictures past where the picture of my foot. And then you'll launch your app and hit open. You're scrolling, scrolling, scrolling. So here's a better way to go. So when you find the photo you want to work on, you just tap, hit your share button and do copy. And then over here on Snapseed, I'm not even going to launch Snapseed. I'm just going to do a long press on Snapseed and do paste. And it pastes that in. So that saves so much time. Why dig back into the camera roll again? And with this grant-worthy picture, I'm going to do something really simple, but I love doing this. Under tools, you know, they have 28 tools. And actually, this will process raw files. So if you open a raw file, you have a magical 29th raw processing uh, uh, effect in here, too, um, tool. So I'm going to tap on perspective and, you know, we got, is this, let me ask you, is this distortion? No, this is perspective, right? Distortion mm -hmm. is when straight lines are rendered curved. This is like looking down railroad tracks. You know, we know they don't get narrower. They appear to. Right. But I'm just going to hit on what looks like a cigarette with stars, right? It looks like a cigarette mated with a Subaru hood, hood badge there. Uh, so I'm going to tap on that. It's a magic wand. And that's, that's pretty amazing, isn't it? that an app that costs zero dollars, Snapseed is free, that you can fix keystoning like that with one tap. And we can apply that and we could go yeah, in- for, I didn't know that. For, for re, I'm sorry, say that again, please. It wasn't I important. Didn't hear it wasn't important. Oh, okay. So one thing people forget about when they use the, the uh, healing brush in Snapseed, when you choose that, there is no brush size, you know, there's no button or slider anywhere for brush size. And if I try just like, if I want to retouch out the little up down lights over here, if I just go in there with my finger, 
see how like like we we always curse at the healing brush when it pulls in adjacent tonalities so it really didn't do a good job at all so i'll hit undo but once you know that if you put two fingers on the screen and pinch out see this it's showing you the size of the brush so you, you can choose the size of brush that's appropriate for the task at hand you do not have to stop over that area i'm just you're just choosing the size of the brush and then when i go over there bam it's gone so uh, that's just that's just a little trick to choose the right size brush now i want to show you something else really fast here uh, uh maybe not maybe not um let's uh, let's oh i know what i want to show you this have any of you used superimpose x Superimpose X is so cool. And I'm going to open up, let's see, I'm going to open this image here in Superimpose X. And this was shot, I think, in Seattle of this alleyway, and there was some moisture on the cobblestone. And I did way back in like 95, this picture called Rodential Resurrection. And we're kind of recreating that. That was done with Photoshop way back. Uh, so I'm going to add another photo in here, photo layer, and I'll go into John's <laughs> folder. And here's the squirrel. And now if this were a ping, there's ping support transparency. But this is a this was a squirrel that Jill and I were coming home down in, when we lived in San Antonio. And here was this squirrel that had been hit by a car, but it wasn't squashed. So here I had this perfectly good dead squirrel. Uh, so we picked it up, you know, took it home and I put him on a white tablecloth and photographed it. So our first job, we need to get rid of that, um, need to get rid of that white surround. So I'm gonna go into mask down here, mask. And we got this wonderful array of, of uh, masking tools here, none of which are labeled. Um, but I'm going to choose, I want because I want to show you this little uh, smart brush here. And then we can choose our settings like brush strength and brush size. So I'm just going to go in here and real fast kind of erase away anything that's not squirrel. So see, and this is so, this brush is so nice. So as long as you don't go over uh, the, the squirrel with your brush, you keep your finger kind of away, you can get wonderful masking with this guy. And I'm not going to worry, we're just for demo purposes, we don't have to have this done perfectly, but I'll try to get work around the, uh, the backside of the squirrel a little bit. It's not an area I'm particularly comfortable with, but we'll, we'll manage in there, something like that. So we're going to pretend that we've done, the, oh, isn't that nice, isn't that nice? So we're going to pretend that we've done this with great finesse on this squirrel. Uh, and let's see if I missed some, yeah, a little bit around there. So that smart brush is really pretty cool, really pretty cool, and we'll get rid of that over there. Now we can also, that squirrel's a little too small, so if we tap on transform down here, we can make that squirrel a little bit bigger. I'll make him about like that. I see a little bit of mask and I missed, but I'm not gonna worry about it. So now here's where it gets fun. Uh, if we wanna go in there, we can hit, under layers, they have this thing called cast shadow. Cast shadow. Now, back when I did this in Photoshop, of course, I had to use the squirrel's shape, sort of like the turtle, to create a shadow, then think about how shadows fall onto a surface and all that. But if we tap cast shadow, and I drag this, now look, there's the shadow, but that's kind of that's kind of the wrong way. This shadow, if you think about light at the end of this alley, kind of coming down and casting a shadow, the shadow would be reversed. So all I'm going to do is take one of these handles and flip the shadow over on itself. And then bring it out, isn't that cool? And I can make it a little bit thicker. And then I love these controls. Look at these controls down here. I can play with the opacity. So we can take the opacity down and we can change with the blur amount. So I'm gonna blur it about that much. We'll do it to opacity. Isn't that sweet? I just, I love stuff like that. That, that would have taken me so much longer in Photoshop. And we just did it here in, in no time whatsoever. Isn't that great? Now, what if we wanted to make this feel warm tone like a like a platinum palladium print so i'm going to put a warm gray layer on top of here by hitting the plus and notice you can make either a photo layer and that's what we did with the squirrel and what i'm gonna do but you can also make an empty layer that you could paint on or do anything with but i'm going to do another photo layer and there's this warm gray that i just made bam and we'll just apply that and to, okay we're finished we got that nice no we're not finished at all right so the first thing we have to do is change the blending mode. We don't want a blob of gray over top of the squirrel. So see the little blend guy? And let me just give you like a, a 15 second explanation because this interface can throw some people. You choose, the first thing you do is choose the thing you want to do on the bottom here and then it pops up a subset. See, we're on layers, so it pops up this subset. Does that make sense? 
Yep. So for instance, right now, I'm, I want to do a layer function. So I want to change the blending mode. So I tap here. And then we got all of our all of our favorites. So I'll just do color and see how we got that nice thing there. And we say, well, that looks good. Well, not really. So I could manually pull that out to fill this fill the shape of the image. But look at this. This is so courteous. They give us under transform fit to canvas. So with one tap, it automatically makes it the size of the damn image. How can you not love that kind of courtesy out of an app? Isn't, isn't that just wonderful? I mean, it's just it's just incredible. What and was then the of name course, of this one again? Now, this is where we should discuss instructor gratuities. Hmm. No, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. <laughs> what what was it, the name of this app again? It is super, let me show you. It's called Superimpose X right there. Superimpose X. And I do a class where I talk about both Image Blender, which is very good and simple, but it doesn't, we couldn't do what we just did here in Image Blender. Image Blender is nice if you're only putting, it's like, it's a two layer thing. Uh, it's beautiful. It, a lot of people can get their head around Image Blender better than Superimpose X. But that's why I teach both, both together in one class, because then people can kind of choose their level of, you know, kind of complexity, what kind of learning curve are they comfortable with? But that was that was pretty cool that we could just uh, when we can change how much warmth we want to apply to that image, so we can take the opacity down, or we can have a lot of warmth. Isn't that nice? So anyway, uh, that's my story, and I'm sticking to it, as they say in the old country. Um, I have a quick question, Dan. Yeah, Rick. yeah, sure. Let me let me stop. Uh, well, yeah, no, go ahead with your question. No, um, when you laid the the shadow down and you were able to um, flip it, you know. Are you able to change the perspective of it like you did with the elevator as well? Yes, I, I won't go back and do it, but yes, no. it had it had handles yeah. where you could manually, so you could introduce, okay. uh, you know, like a you could have it have you know a a different type perspective, yeah. top to bottom. Yes, you you could you could. It's not true warping, but it's like transforming, right? Yeah. So absolutely, yeah, it, it's really a pretty. I think it's three. Someone could check, but I think it's three dollars and ninety nine cents. Uh, superimpose X, and it's really, really good. So thanks for asking. But yeah, you sure can. I just wasn't sure. Thank you. You sure can. Yeah. So, any other questions? Got such a quiet audience today. You just got them enthralled. <laughs> yeah. Dan? Can I say? Dan? Yeah. Yes. Question. Yes. This is this is Ashton in Texas. Um, I sent you an email about five years ago, <laughs> and I think I see where it is. Oh, <laughs> you're, you're seeing the, the unread. Actually, I think it's a lot more than that. Uh, 6,503. Yeah, you really should be, uh, you know, dealing with that rather than, <laughs> rather than talking amazing. to you all. <laughs> so who was it that had a question? Was that Roseanne? So I, um, oh. Holly. Oh, Holly's, yes. Holly, yeah. Um, hi, thank you. So uh, um, um, this is fascinating. And my question is, if you were to take um, images that aren't necessarily iPhone images, but you work on them on your iPhone with these various apps, um, if you were then to go and print them, how large could you print them? Do you lose you know, a lot of the resolution or could you, you know, if initially it was a large file, does it stay a large file after you oh, kind of work on it or know, what? Thanks for asking, Holly. You know, and, and uh, to your point, you know, the answer to most things in life, including this, is it depends. You know, that's the conditional state, not the diaper, right? So for instance, Snapseed, <laughs> you can you can send over Snapseed processes with a plum are 12 megapixel iPhone images, but you could like send over, say your camera has Wi-Fi, you could send over, say, you know, a 30 or 40, like I've sent over the 50 megapixel Olympus, a handheld high res thing. And you can that you can open those in Snapseed, but it saves it at 25. So that that app has like a 25 meg max. Mm -hmm. So that, that's not shabby. No. And now to your question about how big, I mean, I've only I've not, I haven't gone any bigger than 20 by 30. And like most most of those are like from old eight pixel things. Now, like we said, we're at 12. Uh -huh. And I've had students go much bigger. I mean, the the there again, getting back to that it depends rule. Um, you know, we now have incredible software like that Topaz AI Gigapixel for upsampling, which is pretty darn magical. Um, so if you do need to invent pixels that weren't there originally, that would be a great way to do it. But it all kind of depends. You know, are you doing are you doing a picture of the Brooklyn Bridge where you want like every little rivet to be highly defined? Well, you might need more res for that. 
Or are you shooting like ballet dancers and you're dragging the shutter, you know, and you've got streaks of light, you know, streaks of them going across the stage in a half second exposure. You could print that probably at, you know, 25 pixels per inch and it would look gorgeous. So it depends on your subject matter and, mm -hmm. and your thought behind the image, doesn't it? Right. Right. But okay. there's no reason for norm, normal images. I mean, that's kind of evasive, but why you can't go 20 by 30 or bigger from iPhone images. But but there are some other things factored in there. Great. Thank you. Very Thanks much. for asking. Sure. Hey, you want to see something kind of cool? Yeah. Yes. Let me just do one more thing. I apologize. Sure. I can't resist. <laughs> and it's not an image. I don't think I put it in John's folder. So let me go in albums and I'll find it somewhere. Uh, oh, there, uh, do I have, yeah, this one, this has already been processed. Oh, downloading, good. And thanks, heavens, the internet. So this started off way, in fact, are the layers and stuff in here? Let me look in here. No, but here's, here's what I'm gonna do. This is gonna be fun. This is gonna be fun. Uh, we're gonna go in here and we're gonna, okay. So watch this, we're gonna turn it sideways so he's a little bit bigger here for you. So we're gonna actually, this train conductor we can ask him questions. I'm gonna ask him, see, uh, Mr. Conductor, I said, um, are you enjoying today's presentation? Isn't that incredible? Where he, he, what do you think? Do you, do you like the, the group of participants that are here in the audience? Oh, is, that's sad, isn't it? I'm isn't enjoying it, Mr. D. <laughs> <laughs> but this, this, this is wonderful. So we can, with our finger, like, look at this, we can change pupil size, but. I can move his head. So if we wish his head were just around a little bit more, isn't that wonderful? And I can zoom in and show you. So we can reposition in 3D space and I could bring his chin down a little bit. Isn't that great? And then of course we could do goofy stuff like we wanted to amplify his smile. Um, and you know, I wouldn't do that, but sometimes, you know, I think we, we should be after with our photography, we should be after emotional, emotional honesty I think Trump's literal honesty in, in our in creative photography. So no, I wouldn't do something like that. But sometimes, you know, if, if I just made a funnier facial expression or been a little more pleasant looking, just bringing, you know, just bringing a smile up just a smidge on the side like that can really, uh, really just help and see that we just lowered his head a little bit and brought him over. I'll say that again, please. You're not okay. sharing your screen, Mr. D. Yes, he oh, is. And oh, really? I'm not seeing it. Okay, so it, it must are be you, my. Are end. you seeing me? Are you seeing me change uh, screens here? Yes. Yes. Hmm. Okay, it might okay. might be a problem, Anya, down there. Maybe the power's going off to your router too, or something. Yeah, or, could be. Yeah. Okay. So, um, so but I'll Cam's asking up. if this app can be used on PCs. Actually, this is for iPhone only. Yeah, iPhone now with the um. With the new M1 Max that can run at least some of the iOS apps, that was one of the big pluses of going to Apple's own chip. So I have not done that. I don't own an M1 Max. So maybe someone can speak to that who does have an M1, who has tried uh, loading in iOS apps and what their experience has been. I don't know, but that's supposed to be one of the pluses of the M1. But Snapseed, Snapseed was available for Mac and Windows at some point. I don't know if it was. It still is. And and when Google bought it, they killed off the Mac and PC versions immediately, which is a shame because for a lot of people that would have done all the editing they ever needed. And back then it was like $5 or something, mm -hmm. um, but it's gone now for desktop. But anyone running an M1 Mac try to try to run any uh, iOS apps on their M1 Mac? I was hoping we'd have some feedback. Yeah, on and that. people point out Snapseed is on Android too. Yes, yep, it sure is. Isn't the sound deafening? I think that Apple's going to have a big problem on their hands when they do A big this. problem? With the M1. With the, with the M1, yep. What kind of problem? I, I, I'm curious. People won't convert. Yeah, they will. Yeah. Oh, I, 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 oh. I would take, oh boy, I'm, I'm anxious to convert. I'll tell you that. They'll, they'll convert. I would, no way I'd get another um, Intel at this point. My next Mac, which might be the iMac later this year with an M1X chip, it's going to be M1X. I ain't, I ain't getting no Intel. You know, the, Apple, the has long, is that... Apple has a long history of getting out over their skis and then well, dragging the rest of the industry with them. Aren't we all still using PowerPC uh, Macintoshes? Back, back when Motorola made the chip, right? And Motorola kind of exactly. got... Exactly. 
Yep. And, yep. and, and some apps still need the power PC in order to run that you need, or at least- And the need. reality is that with what's been going on for the past year and people out of work and no business and no this and no that, there are a lot of people that are not going to convert. And if Apple wants to drag those people for, with them, all right, it is going to take a long time for them to do it. And I love Apple. Apple works on a pretty long time frame, I think. They can Say wait. it again. Apple works. Apple works on a long time frame. That's okay. That's okay. All right. Hey Steve, go off. How are you? I will not convert to the I will not convert to Big Sur. How many There's people converted to Big How many people converted to Big to Big Sur? I did. No problems. Not so a this, problem here. No problem. Well, Jeff, I, you know, if, no if, I, if, I, if I had the contacts that some of you people will have, I wouldn't have the problems either. Well, I, there's, I but, nice to see you, Mike. An, hey, Harris. You know, then again, uh, this is the coffee mug I use every day. Uh-huh. <laughs> Big Harris, because, did you have something to Michael? say? Yeah, sure. Well, here's, here's my hat that I like to wear. <laughs> Harris, you need to speak <laughs> up and show us that Delayed. gear. Come on. Oh, okay. Hey, Harris. Oh my goodness, look you know, at that. That's amazing. My mom, my, my mom, my wife hates it. She wants me to really trim it, but I need to really meet with some bird ex beard experts to figure out what I can do with it because I've just been growing it, you know? <laughs> I, you on, know. On, on, on the Mac discussion, guys, there's an argument that says with lockdown, uh, Apple's sales have increased quite, quite considerably. They're the best quarter uh, for phone sales and with more people at home using Zoom and so on, I suspect technology will take off even more than it has recently. Yeah, I'm I'm waiting, and I, I you know, I some of you know I'm, I'm tied into the industry on the, the back end. Um, I'm waiting for the next variant of the M1, and I'm going to pick up a mini. And and I kind of disagree with you, Michael, because you can get a mini now for what the starting price is like seven hundred dollars. Seven, and yeah. It blows the doors off of every Mac that preceded it. In fact, it blows the doors. I, I, I have no problem with the computer with but the M one. I have a problem. I have a problem with all of the applications that I have will have to be changed. I'm well, not, not willing to do that. Not really, Michael. You know, it has it has the equivalent of Rosetta. And a, the vast majority of apps run just beautifully, and in fact, much faster under the M1. So I, I don't really think, and I, and I think what's, for me, what's most important, because one of my specialties is storage and storage <laughs> uh, malfeasance and, uh, and problems, um, is that you're, you're finally seeing a real consolidation of Type C USB, you've got you've got Thunderbolt at a higher level. You've got accessories now that are affordable and incredibly fast. Um, you've got NAS devices that are that are superb, superb and easy to use. So I think for a photographer to stay current, especially with storage devices, is more and more important than it has been in the past um, because you're finally getting away from you know all these different solutions. So. I personally think the M1 is a brilliant move. I think even the way it works with uh, memory and how it deals with, with, um, with virtual memory, it, it rewrites the rules on how Photoshop is used, for instance, in terms of memory usage. So um, even the cheapest M1 is, is a substantial performer. Even if you got no, the- Never the, say cheapest, less well, expensive. No, expensive. Okay, so. I mean- I'm, right. I'm going to sell off my beard here in order to raise some money. So. All you have to do is just is is just get a little closer to that flame on the on the on the, on the range. That, that, <laughs> it'll, it'll happen by it'll happen by magic. It'll be gone by magic. Now, <clears throat> let, let let me explain something. And I think that we're we're hedging on a certain area that becomes very important to a lot of us right here. All right, a lot of us have. White hair, some on the hair, some on the head, some on the, on, on the face. <clears throat> but what happens is when you reach the ripe old age of 76 years old, you begin, to say to, you begin to say to yourself, there's a point of diminishing returns. 
And the sure. adage of the only difference between men and boys is the cost of our toys. Will now, the computers Harris, that I, ask I you currently a question, have? Harris. Go ahead. Hey. I just want to ask, sorry to jump. I want to ask Harris, super duper, that's my experience on an Intel three-year-old MacBook Pro. Super duper has been killed by Big Sur. Have you heard anything about when they're going to be fixing that? You know, I have it, and I and I think and I think it's important. I think to keep in mind that um, the M1 is not what's what kills you know an app. It's 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 a much more complicated issue. Um, a lot of well, this is Big Sur on yeah, this is Big Sur well, on an Intel that killed Super Duper. Right, right, and and Big Sur is a problem, and 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 also they've revealed some rather breathtaking um, security holes in it. But, but I think the, the lar there's larger issues at play. And, and I think like the app store is a real problem for developers and, you know, in the sandboxing and a lot of the requirements they did, um, a lot of the prevention of, you know, app developers reaching their actual customers by going through the app store. And so I think, you know, you are seeing a big move in developers doing their own things. You know, they're, they, you know most of the people I know are encouraging people not to use the app store, but to you know, alternatively get it from them directly with more features. So I think, um, <clears throat> and, and also, you know, Apple is legendarily bad with letting developers know ahead of time what they're doing. I mean, there were big Sur betas and I, I had a couple of those, but you know, you, you find out about, Apple's like the company that shows up for a date that's a, the wrong photo. You know, you, you don't know who you're getting and you don't know what you get till you download it. You know, the developers, aren't too much, too much, they're not too far ahead. And that's, it's a problem with the way Apple's secrecy culture works. It really doesn't give developers enough time. So I think like super duper is brilliant. There's all these, and I, I think if it's, a, if, it's a, if it's a successful application, it'll go forward. I mean, I use Sound Studio by Lucius Kwok. Most, a lot of people know him, he's great. And I think it's one of the best simple sound apps out there. And he wrote to me and he was, he had the, you know, the, the developer unit of the M1. And he said, he's not sure he's gonna go forth with another version of it because it does require a substantial rewrite. But those are business decisions more than, the, you know, and so I, I don't tend to vilify developers as much as it may be frustrating. Um, but for me, I just take into consideration the larger ecosystem at play. You know, all of these system. manufacturers like, like Apple, they have right now in, in 2021, a huge investment to protect. It's not like things were back in 1993, all right? Uh, where we were, let, let's go into dad's garage and, and, and build something and, and make become successful. These, these, these companies have huge um, assets and liabilities. And one of the liabilities that they have um, is the fact that if you give your um, your developers too much of a head start, a lot of this stuff leaks out. Too much of it leaks out. Um, certainly, I I was part of a problem. Pro well, I'm always part of a problem, but I I was <clears throat> I was uh, um, uh, uh, privy to a particular problem. Uh, uh, between um, um, Canon and, a, and another uh, digital software manufacturer that Jeff that she, that Jeff Shiwi knows about, and 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 um, and Canon paid the price for 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 what they did, um, and and over the years that that expanded and grew. So I have no problem with a company looking at at their at their assets and, and checking out whether or not the liability uh, to give me giving developers a, a, a heads up on something is going to hurt or harm them in the global scope of things. Well, I'm interested in, in, in Jeff's view because Jeff, you're so intimately tied <laughs> to Adobe and other companies, you know. Well, if we can take this in a little bit different direction, I, I hear people leaving, and I think we're talking a little bit too much about hardware and software yes, here. Right. Yes. Well, Jeff just brought in, typed into the chat, Dan, what do you attribute your creativity to, and how do you develop it? 
Well, I wish I could say it was good drugs, Jeff, but such is not the case. Um, you know, I, I think creativity springs from different sources, and we could make this an open topic. Uh, my mother was a musician, and so I think some of that creative spirit perhaps was instilled, you know, from from her teachings. But I think if you're, you know, and I'm, I'd rather be considered a photographer who makes art than an artist who uses photography. I think there is a distinction there. And that's just me. But, you know, you're, you're going to find your own path. And the uh, we're, artists are supposed to see better than other people, aren't they? And we're supposed to see and not we're supposed to see more and we're supposed to see in different ways. Um, so after that, the putting together, you know, whether it's chemical or optical, you know, all that, that's all secondary. So to your point, Jeff, um, I'm not sure how you develop a creative spirit, but I know taking a lot more pictures helps, doesn't it, for all of us. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I, like in camera clubs, and camera clubs can be pretty static with, you know, like kittens in a basket and birds on a branch kind of thing. But I was trying to encourage people to say, you know, it used to be you'd cut pictures out of magazines, but now just bring in some JPEGs on your iPhone or Android or of pictures you admire, but then talk about what, what do you admire in them? What are the attributes of that photo? Is it the subject matter? Is it the lighting? Is it the composition? And once you identify those attributes that resonate with you, then you can find ways to try to incorporate that in your own work, not necessarily copying someone else's work, but doing a blend. We're always borrowing and blending, aren't we? Well, I was going to... Um... I'm going to save part of what I was going to talk about creativity for next week because I'm on next week. And, um, mm -hmm. but I think creativity really comes from a sense of uh, self liberation. And it's often encouraged by your parents at a young age. Um, and it's yep. the willingness to do something that nobody else is doing. And in mm -hmm. fact, not only just the willingness, but the urgency to do something different, uh, that you feel compelled to look at what um, everything you've done and then just jump in a completely different direction. Or, you know, a lot of it is discovery. Inspiration and perspiration are both excellent um, um, uh, uh, roles towards creativity. And the one thing that I, I get a kick out of you is the fact that uh, um, you're like the fucking Energizer Bunny. You've got lots of little projects, doing lots of little things, and that constantly doing things, you can't help but be creative if you're doing something that you've never done before, right? And I think that's one of the things that a lot of people are intimidated or afraid to be different than other people. Well, that, you make good points. Can I give a plug for a book, Art and Fear by uh, Ted Orland and David Bales? Absolutely, yes. Art and Fear, get that book. It's on. It's incredible. It, well, you'll be reading through there and say, yeah, that's me. He'll describe, you know, why we go into creative slumps. And it's wonderful. And I always like to think back one time, Jerry Yulesman, the first time I met him in a workshop with the Friends of Photography, he talked about how he went through phases where he thought he should put his camera down and never touch it again. And that talk about liberation, Jeff, I thought if someone like Jerry, who's was like, like the top of, of the creative pyramid, can have those times of self-doubt and disappointment, it's for, certainly fine for the rest of us lesser creatures to go through those same kind of periods of concern and discouragement, isn't it? Unless you want to cut up your ear. <laughs> Well, you know, self-doubt self -doubt is inevitable if you're going to ask of most of yourself. And it, it's part of that process of trying things that you know you might fail at, being willing to fail, being willing to make stuff that is really not very good. But it's that process of discovery and ex exploration that just keeps pressing me and pressing me and pressing me to go out, look around, see things I haven't seen before, and you know we are, we're completely different photographers, Dan. But it's the uh, it's that seduction of what my eyes see and my heart reacts to that just keeps bringing me back to trying it. And even when I fail to record what it is that I'm trying to hold, boy, you know the trying teaches me something about that moment and teaches well me something about my and teaches me about my heart at the same time. And that's Stephen, that's what really matters to me. Stephen, I have to ask you a question. Do you ever think of something intellectually 
and then go out and try to find it? Or do you find it and create something from your intellectual understanding of what you saw? Well, there's always an intellectual component to trying to understand what I see, but I'd say it's more heart than intellect. No, but do and you ever- No, I don't, I don't go out and try and illustrate concepts in my mind. No, I just don't. Okay. That's not where my interest in image making lies. Have you it ever lies, tried doing that? It, it, what? Have you ever tried doing that? Yeah, and I've made a lot of bad photographs trying to do that. Oh, the funny thing is that there was a very short period of time, Stephen, where um, I don't know if you knew this, but I talked with Mary because there was a period of time in which she wanted you to become more commercial. And there were, I, you know, I come from a commercial background and I, I kept trying to explain to her that it's like uh, Stephen wasn't, wouldn't work well in a commercial environment <laughs> where you actually have an assignment to go out and illustrate a given certain thing and have to produce something um, as opposed to going out and just seeing because you're a visual seer, you're not you're not a, a production value sort of guy. Well, I've done commercial work, Jeff. It's not that I can't do an assignment. It's just that it's not where my real interests lie. Yeah. It, it, and of course, the most successful commercial assignment is still going to be one where you discover something because of your visual prejudices and sensitivity that somebody else wouldn't. And that that's where your, your value even lies in a commercial sense, in addition to whatever skills you might have. By the way, just so you, you all understand the context, Jeff was talking about my ex-wife, Mary. So maybe it's a, you know the way, oh. the way things evolve. <laughs> to yeah. to several of your points about you know the importance of influences during childhood, could I take like ninety seconds and show a few slides of my first work from nineteen fifty six compared to contemporary images, which I think will drive home this point. Sure. Could I do Please that real go. quickly? Okay, I'm going to share my screen real fast here and over in Keynote. We'll jump back over there. And uh, so this little section here, so it's personal paths with art. And so this is, this is a pre-photographic era working with crayon in the first grade. And you can see the bird in the tree and it looks like he's smoking a cigarette, but I think it's just a smudge. So that's, you know, 1956. And here is a contemporary platinum print of speckled vulture in pine forest. Then we go back to 1956 with this building in the center. And then we go to the flat iron in spring, which is a pigment over platinum. Then we go back to 1956 with the bold use of symmetry with the building in the center and the trees on either side. And that's my work. And then here's a contemporary, the school and trees, Scotland with the building in the center and trees on the side. And this last one, which was so advanced, the teacher, she didn't call it postmodern, she called it post-futurist. I'm kidding. Uh, but that's 1956. Mondrian. And then here's this picture of a train station in in um, in Holland. So um, that, that's, I just wanted to share those with you. So I think it's pretty amazing how, how powerful those influences can be from very early on. So you're saying you never really grew up. You just grew better. <laughs> Good one. <laughs> the only way the heart can still beat well, soundly is to never grow up. Well, you know, with Jill and I, when my mom passed years ago, we're looking through these things, the kind of things that parents would put on a refrigerator door. We're looking at these and we looked at one another and I said, I'm making the same images that I made in 1956, except now I'm using a camera instead of, you know, crayon. It's just incredible. Yeah, but you put the crayon back into it as well, Dan. That's true. <laughs> <laughs> Very cool. Well, does anyone else have anything else they want to add? Or Dan, do you have any final words for everyone today? Oh, just keep making photos. Yeah, and deep appreciation for Dan, your sensitivities, your articulate nature, and the good guy that I know you are. Oh, well, you, you're very kind. Thank you so much. And back at you. Thank, thank you, Dan you. and John. Thank you. Sure. Yeah, thank you Appreciate both. Everyone. Thank you, Dan. Appreciate everyone for being here and John inviting me. And I'm, I'm going to warn you right here and now, Dan. I'm going to take one of your classes here pretty soon. <laughs> dare, dare accept it. <laughs> good. Better start oh. taking Ritlin. So on Thursday, we're going to have an open discussion so we can continue any of this Apple Mac stuff if you want, or we can talk about pictures. <laughs> and then on Monday is going to be Jeff Shiwi. So I'm really looking forward to that. I've been working hard at finding a bunch of uh, early work. So great. This is going to, I'm sure it's going to be really wonderful.
Does, Steve, that, I that a... make it 19th, does that make it 19th century work, Jeff? Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> Stephen, I have a question for you. Yeah. For, um, for who? Have you, uh, 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 Johnson, mm -hmm. have you been spending a lot of time outside? Yes, a lot. You, you, you look like you've, you've hired ex-President Trump's uh, makeup, makeup artist. artist? <laughs> yeah. You're you mean very the color red. Skin? Oh, you're yeah, very yeah, red. That are George Hamilton's. <laughs> oh, <laughs> yeah, right. we go with George Hamilton. <laughs> the yeah. iPhone color, no orange makeup. No, that's... Uh, that's <laughs> uh, <laughs> well, thanks, everyone. Thank, thank you, you thank you very much. Thank you. Bye. Let me Bye. stop the recording. So many people out there too. Grow your beards. <laughs> thank you. Uh, yeah, Karen, it's good to see you. Thank good you, everyone.